Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be reading Mark 9, 2 through 13, so please join me as I do that. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful, wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they chose to abuse him, just as the scriptures predicted. Good morning, St. Moe's. My name is Brian Nichols, and I uh, am honored to bring the word to you today. Thank you, Jack, for reading. Um, what's the greatest moment in your life? What's a momentous occasion in your life? When you think about it, were there certain things that maybe kind of uh, certain different elements of your life that kind of met in one instance that gave this moment some extra spark? We're not too far removed from the Super Bowl. Maybe my football friends will like that, but maybe not everyone else. But at the Super Bowl, all right, we have an annual uh, outing, annual football event that draws a lot of eyeballs. We have... This past year, a team, the Kansas City Chiefs, looking to become repeat champions, which doesn't happen very often. And on top of that, it was in a city that had never hosted the Super Bowl before, Las Vegas, a city known for its pomp and entertainment. And then the cherry on top, the biggest pop star in the world. Where are my Swifties at? She's not only there, but she has an overt rooting interest in the game, she's cheering for one of the teams, not just showing up for a good time. And what that did was all these had converged to bring about the greatest moment in TV history, the most watched television program in history. Over 120 million TV screens showing it. Where we are here in the Gospel of Mark at the Mount of Transfiguration, you're going to see several themes that have been winding through the first eight chapters converge here on this mountaintop. The themes you're going to see are uh, Jesus' power on display. You've seen that throughout Mark 1 through 8. You see Jesus redefining, reconfiguring what it means to be great or honorable. And also you see Jesus' identity crystallized here. Who is this Jesus is one of the biggest themes running through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I'd like to start here with this first theme, who is Jesus, because, and hear me closely on this, it's the most important question you could ever be asked. Who is this Jesus? Who is this teacher? This teacher that eats with tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. This teacher that touches lepers. This teacher that eats on the Sabbath. This teacher that uh, heals the paralytic, says he forgives sins, feeds 5,000, calms the storm, casts out demons. Who is this Jesus? From the jump, from the very beginning, there's no doubt in Mark's gospel who he is. Chapter 1, verse 1, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is the visible image of the invisible God, God's bloodline, his likeness, his carbon copy. 
God's agent for representation and redemption here in the world. God the Father, God the Son, in concert, in harmony, in lockstep concerning values, purpose, goals, objectives. And I want you to know this. See that God sends himself. From the first chapter, I mean, from the first chapter, first verse of Mark's gospel, God is sending himself into this. It's what he's always done. God is missional. God takes the initiative. He's proactive. In Genesis, in Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sin, who does God send? He doesn't send an angel. He doesn't send another created being. He runs after them. God sends himself, and he's doing it here in Mark. The proclamation, this grand proclamation of who Jesus is continues in Mark 1, 11, at Jesus' baptism. This is my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. God is very clear about who Jesus is. It's us that have the resistance and the rejection. You see throughout Mark's one th Mark 1 through 8, we come up and say, well, he's just a teacher. He's just a prophet. At one point, people come around and say, ah, I'm sorry, he's actually a demon-possessed deceiver. And then some people come around and say, I think he's just crazy. In Mark 8, right before the Mount Transfiguration, you have Peter says, that's all junk. Jesus, you are the Messiah. And Peter says, you got it right, Peter. Good job. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. And now this Messiah that you're hoping for and longing for is going to secure what you're hoping for and longing for by suffering and dying on a cross. And Peter says, Jesus, that's bad theology. I mean, Messiah doesn't do that. You're wrong. You see, the rejection and the resistance to who Jesus is comes from us. God's clear about who he is. So on this mount, <clears throat> with Peter in tow, we have God stamping his testimony about who Jesus is, a living, breathing, walking testimony. Mark 9, 7. This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. When we think of the Mount of Transfiguration, we can get a little lost in the, the glory and in the wonder of it all, and we will get to that. But I want to look at right now is this statement, because this core teaching is critical. So we're going to unpack this verse real quick. The first sentence is probably pretty familiar. You heard it at the baptism. This is my dearly loved son. The second sentence is new, and it's a command. Listen to him. Why a command? Probably because we don't do it. Peter didn't in chapter 8. The wind and the waves, they do it in chapter 4. When he speaks, they listen. But we don't do it. One of my kids came to me the other night and they said, Dad, you don't have to tell me to put my pajamas on and my, brush my teeth before bed. And I said, yes, I do. Because <laughs> if I stop doing that, in about a week, you're going to have bark growing in here, okay? And you're going to be wearing the same clothes for eight days straight, right? So they, they still need that command. They didn't take that advice very well, but that's the way it is. <clears throat> God here says, listen. He doesn't say like. He doesn't say be around. He doesn't say know a lot about. He says, listen. It's a verb. It's active. Listen to him. There's no restrictions here. There's no qualifiers here. There's no parameters. There's no limits. Listen to him. Not just on Sunday or not just before breakfast or at some, certain other, some other time you have, listen to him. The father here cherishes the son, dearly loved son. And he wants the audience to do the same. The first question for us this morning is, do you? Do you cherish him? Do you listen to him? I'm going to double click on this listen to him real quick. You can accept the command, listen to him, or you can reject it. We have free will. He gives you the choice. But for those of us that accept it, 
listening to him allows you to quit the project of self. To quit manufacturing your standing or your status or your greatness or your honor. You can give that up. How? Because listening to Jesus puts your whole being in his hands. He's the potter, you're the clay. He can mold you, shape you, break you, and remake you. When you get, put, your hand, put your life in his hands, that unity with Jesus, that allegiance to Jesus, that identity in Jesus frees you up. We live in a kind of anxious age. What kind of parent am I? What kind of student am I? What kind of athlete am I? What kind of professional am I? What kind of friend am I? Am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? What kind of social influencer or social commentator am I? I want you to hear this verse again. Listen to my, this is my dearly loved son, listen to him. And in doing so, lay down the image of yourself that you're so anxiously building. Unless the Lord builds the house, the Psalms say, it's workers labor in vain. There's peace there. Letting Jesus take over. Listening to Jesus, making him the only audience you're concerned with, frees you up. Your life, your words, your actions, one with Jesus, united with him, just as he is one with the Father in lockstep, as it was always meant to be. Take, listening to Jesus takes your eyes off of yourself. It liberates you, and it resets your gaze onto the Father and other people. That's what listen to him means. All right, the, this perspective, this idea has been building in Mark, okay, and it leads us to our second point that's converging here on the mountain. If you look back at Mark 8, 3, 40, 34 and 35, Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, new allegiance, you must give up your own way Quit your project of self. Take up your cross, new identity, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. New allegiance, new identity, new focus, new family when you listen to him. Is that good news to any of you? It was for me. Quitting the project of myself was good news for me. Does anyone, when you see this, uh, Mark 9, 7, does anyone see purpose and peace in that verse? I found that too. When I quit trying to manufacture whatever I thought this should be, and I listened to him. Mark three thirty five says, anyone who does God's will is my brother and my sister and mother. There's an old, <laughs> there's an old lyric that gets stuck in my head sometime, and it says, you gave me life, now show me how to live. Jesus does that. He's giving you new life, and he's going to show you how to live. The new life and new family that Jesus is calling people to comes from a new reconfigured idea of what greatness and honor is. In our world, greatness and honor functions in term of what we, terms of what we have. But in God's kingdom, greatness and honor function in the way of what you lay down or what you give up. Jesus on this mount, having just forecast his coming suffering, betrayal, brutal murder, the uh, complete and total emptying of his bodily life is clothed in brilliant light and receives a testimony from on high about his example and his authority. 
through his wounds, we are healed. Because he gave up his self for us. We can be healed. And he gets honor and glory from the Father. Jesus lays himself down to bring others up. Leading to the Mount of Transfiguration, right before all of this, you see Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, laying himself down for others as well. He dines with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners, giving equality to them. When you shared a dinner table, as maybe similar to today, but definitely back then, it gave equality. It showed we're peers. He touched lepers. If you touch a leper, you get sick. Right? But what Jesus does in touching the leper is shows that he's contagious, not them. He goes to uh, the Gentile country to meet a demon-possessed Gentile, and in doing so, creates a new disciple in a new land. Coming down the mountain, <laughs> coming down the mountain in Mark 9, 35, Jesus hears his disciples talking about something. And he checks them because he knows what they're talking about. They're talking about which one of them is the greatest. In Mark 9, 35, Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be servant of everyone else. Jesus gives that call to his people because that's what he did. He wants them to follow him. The second question for us today is, do we, want that family resemblance? Do we want that image on us? Can I share a quick story? Are you guys all following? Yeah? I'm, I'm going to try to be real super quick on this. I practice very hard. Okay. I have a friend. He, he was incarcerated for a very long time. About six months into his incarceration, the he recommitted his life to the Lord, and that zeal that he once had when he was younger, before he was incarcerated, came back. And he started sharing his faith. He started leading Bible studies wherever he was and in whatever institution he was. And by some point in his incarceration, he was at an institution that had something called the honor tier. It's a tier where inmates were, because of their character and behavior, that they were elevated. They were a little more uh, relaxed. They had a pool table. They had doors were kind of open a little bit more. They had a lot more freedom than some of the other places. And in this honor tier, he had a Bible study. And a lot of guys in the honor tier were Christians. And one day, my friend with his Bible study said, guys, this is great, but there's nothing going on down there in the other tiers in this place for Jesus. We need to go and do that. And my, fr and my friend's Bible study guy said, it's a great idea, but I'm I'm not leaving here. <laughs> it's too nice here. I worked hard to get here. And my friend heard him. But because he wanted the family resemblance, he was obedient. He listened to the Lord. He asked for a transfer out of the honor tier, down to general population, where it's dirtier, it's stricter, it's a lot messier, it's a lot harder to share the gospel and bring this good news of new life in Jesus to people who had not heard it. That's the family resemblance. That's what honor or greatness looks like in the new kingdom of God, because you're giving up yourself. Okay, <clears throat> so on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have God stamping his uh, approval of Jesus's identity. We have God stamping what it looks like to be great or honorable in the kingdom of God. And last, we have Jesus' display of power. Over and over again in the Gospel of Mark, there's a, a word that keeps coming up. The word is immediately. Immediately, the storm stopped. Immediately, the demons left. Immediately, the leper was healed. Immediately, the dead girl woke up. Jesus' power is on constant display. Boom, immediately. He speaks and it happens. Here, instantly, immediately, Jesus is whew, clothed in white, revealing himself, pulling back the veil, clothed in light, majesty, glory personified. 
I have a hard time even coming up with words to describe the situation. It is a glimpse of not only what's to come, right? But God, in that moment, gives the disciples eyes to see who Jesus really is. You also have on this scene uh, elements that are steeped in Old Testament imagery. You have this cloud that surrounds them. In the Old Testament, as the Israelites were leaving Egypt, what did they have? They had a cloud by day. At the end of Exodus, when they set up the tabernacle, what fills it? A cloud. At the beginning of 1 Kings, when they set up the temple, what fills it? A cloud. God's presence with them. You also have Moses, who I'm guessing was wearing a name tag, because I don't know how else they would have figured it out. <laughs> okay? You have Moses there, and he represents the fullness of the law, but also was a figure that prepared people for God dwelling with them. You have Elijah, also with the name tag, who represents all the fullness of the prophets. And what do the prophets speak about? How God's presence will once again dwell with you, Israel, at some point, because they were in exile. You have them here now with God's presence. All together. Peter even says, let's, let's build some tents. That's what you guys did in Exodus and Tabernacle. Let's do it here. I don't know what supplies he would have had, but I guess he'll figure that out. <laughs> it's very fancy. It's very beautiful. It's amazing. But sometimes we can read the Mount of Transfiguration and say, that's amazing. But so what? What do, what, what do I do with that today? How does that impact my day-to-day -day life? This, ver this not, it's definitely not a verse, this quote from a pastor has always sat with me. And it says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God's glory isn't going anywhere. You see it all through the Old Testament. You're going to see it all through the New Testament. But his, our satisfaction in him, that's the variable in the equation. To be satisfied in him, you need to be in a right relationship with him. To be in a right relationship with him, you need to sack your sin nature. The Bible overarchingly tells a story of God's image bearers, humanity, rejecting God's interference in their lives. We, don't, we know what you want me to do with my words and my will and my thoughts, but I'm going to figure it out. Not one in God's interference is a pretty good working definition of, of what sin is, and it started in Eden, and it carries through each and every one of us. We don't want God to interfere in our life. Yet, on the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark 9, 7, that command and that statement are celebrating God's interference in our life, of exalting it, uplifting it. So that's the problem here. This is what God wants us to have, but we reject it. With that rejection comes separation. As a, a, a pastor once said, uh, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, humanity, when we sin, we die immediately in our spirit, progressively in our bodies, and ultimately in our souls. That's that separation. That's humanity. That's our state. That's the state of God's image bearers. But what does God do? He sends himself to intercede. Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus to die for us while we were still rejecting his interference in our lives, while we were still sinners. If we reject this free gift... We remain hopeless. But if we accept it, if we lean the full weight of our lives on Jesus as our Lord and Savior from our sin, if we celebrate his interference in our life, if we welcome him, if we listen to him, then all of it's reversed. We're justified in our spirit immediately. We're sanctified in our bodies progressively. And we're glorified ultimately. That's the reversal. That's the good news.
I started this off by saying, hey, what was your greatest experience in your life? Maybe you thought about it or maybe you didn't. But for me, the greatest experience in my life was when I started listening to Jesus. When I could uh, quit that project of self and I could accept Jesus' identity. And I could submit to him as Lord and Savior and grow to glorify him by being satisfied in him. Nothing else can compare to that. Three, well, I had like a whole list of things to walk away from with this. <laughs> but I'm going to try to keep it to three here. There might be some subsections, but. <clears throat> All right, Mark 9 starts with Jesus being alone with his disciples. For you today, if you are one that says, yes, I am a disciple of Jesus. Do you make time to get alone with Jesus? What would be different about your day if that was a priority? Before you woke up, all right, I'm going to schedule this time here. And in that time with Jesus, do you make time to listen to him? We have a lot of time when we ask for things. We have a lot of time when we um, even ask for other people. But do we make time to just sit there and be quiet and listen to him? Jesus modeled that greatness and honor in the kingdom of God and what it looks like. Do you want that family resemblance? How do you want to grow in Christ-likeness? Last one. If it's true that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him, then does God satisfy you? What will satisfy you if God himself does not? Do you have that right relationship with Jesus so that you can be satisfied by him? Now, Proverbs twenty twelve says, uh, ears that hear, eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. I'm praying for you guys today to have ears that hear, and eyes that see what he wants for you. Before I wrap up and pray, we always have uh, volunteers at the prayer stations here. If you have any questions or anything you would want to pray for, please join us over there. I'm going to pray for us real quick. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for this time to just share who you are, to look at you on this Mount of Transfiguration. Father, I pray for our lives to be transfigured. I pray for our lives to be made new. God, I thank you for time with friends. And I pray for how we listen to you today, this week, this month. God, thank you so much for your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.